You know, when I was um, 18 years old, living in New Zealand, yes, I did that. I went over to get a wife, and I got a good one, <laughs> and then I left. But uh, anyway, while I was living there, um, around the age of 18, I, I got really desperate to get a job. Um, back then, I had a strong Canadian accent, and apparently a lot of Canadians uh, had been going over to New Zealand on working holidays, and so it seemed like no one wanted to give me a job because they expected that I would just leave after a few weeks or so, and so I really struggled to get a job. And the first two jobs that I finally got only paid commissions on sales. Uh, one was selling insulation, and the other was selling encyclopedias. Now, I guess you could still sell insulation these days, and many people still are, but even the best of the best salesmen, I think, would not do very well uh, in selling encyclopedias these days. So, selling a you know, set of you know, big, heavy books for $2,000 was a hard sell back then when I was 18, and today my guess is that it would be an impossible task. After all, why would you spend $2,000 for a set of big books when Google apparently knows everything for free? And if Google doesn't know, you could always ask Siri or look it up on YouTube, or if all that fails, of course, those of you who are married, you could ask your wives. <laughs> because they often know everything. I'm so glad Brittany goes out to uh, Kresh. Uh, at the beginning of the sermon because it gives me liberties that I otherwise wouldn't have. Anyway, one thing is true, um, and that is that people today indeed have free access to volumes of knowledge. But folks, knowledge on its own is just information. And information without application is actually pretty useless. There are numerous great minds around the world that, have, that, you know, that are full of knowledge and information, and yet they seem incapable of doing anything significant with that knowledge. You know, there are many clever university graduates that are unemployed and will sometimes remain unemployed for many years after their graduations. Knowledge is great and it's necessary. But knowledge alone is often just not enough to bring about the kind of changes that we might need to happen in our lives. Knowledge alone is not enough to make us successful. Revelation, on the other hand, is different from knowledge. Unlike knowledge, revelation from God seems to have this power that motivates us to apply the knowledge He gives us. Now, I'm hoping that one day soon that the penny will drop uh, with the Church of Jesus Christ, and that when it does, the church will receive a revelation that will bring it back, um, you know, to an expectation for the miraculous life that God wants it to have. What the scriptures will show us again this morning is, I believe, already known knowledge to us. It is stuff that we have heard before, it's stuff that we've read before. Stuff that you've heard me say before. But I also believe that when God makes this knowledge that we already have a revelation, then this revelation may change us and send us in the direction that I believe God plans for us to go in as a church. Last week we read about the paralytic named Aeneas who received his miracle when Peter prayed for him, and he started walking in, uh, walking in after being uh, bedridden for eight years. What an awesome miracle that was. I love miracles because they not only bring glory to God, but they change people's lives in a way that nothing else can. Furthermore, it's a great buzz when God allows you to be a part of um, the miracle by simply, um, you know, praying for people. I'm just going to take a minute because this thing is not blinking at me. Is it blinking at me? Oh, it's blinking at you on that side. That's okay. Because <laughs> if it doesn't do that, then I'm just like prattling along and there's no sound. 
And of course, I don't even know if anyone actually listens to that on YouTube, but anyway, we're doing it for those few that keep asking. Um, as I said, it is really a great buzz, you know, when we're involved in, 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 in a miracle, you know, by just simply praying for people. It's absolutely awesome, awesome and it, awesome, awesome, <laughs> awesome, and it just never gets old. Now, as you may have noticed, you know, I have been talking quite a bit about miracles lately, and, and that's because I don't think that we have all caught the vision that we can all be involved in miracles. Yes, there are some people who have, you know, been given the specific ministry of performing miracles, but you know what? That doesn't mean that they have a monopoly on miracles. That doesn't mean that they are the only people who can do miracles. Those of us who have the Holy Spirit in us can also perform miracles when the need arises, as the Scriptures tell us. It's just that many of you haven't tried. In our text today, we see another miracle taking place. As we read about it, I would like you to you know, try to picture yourself in the room with Peter when it happens. Feel you know, what the energy and the atmosphere in that room would have been like. Let's go to Acts chapter 9, and let's read from verse 36. There was a believer in Joppa named Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. I would stick with Tabitha if I were her. Uh, she was always doing kind things for others and helping the poor. About this time, she became ill and died. Her body was washed for burial and laid in an upstairs room. But the believers had heard that Peter was nearby at Lydda. So they sent two men to beg him, please come as soon as possible. And so Peter returned with them. As soon as he arrived, they took him to the upstairs room. The room was filled with widows who were weeping and showing him the coats and other clothes Dorcas had made for them. But Peter asked them all to leave the room. Then he knelt and prayed. Turning to the body, he said, Get up, Tabitha. And she opened her eyes. When she saw Peter, she sat up. Then he gave her his hand and helped her up. Then he called in the widows and the believers, and he presented her to them alive. The news spread through the whole town, and many believed in the Lord. Again, we see many people in this town of Joppa believing in the Lord because of a miracle. You see, folks, the truth is that, that some people just need help to believe in the Lord. And miracles help them to believe. And in this regard, God is always, uh, you know, he's always willing to help people believe. And that's why many of the miracles were done. Yes, of course, the people who received the miracles were blessed, no end, but also the people who are watching were blessed. If you've been following the Lord for any length of time, and, and, and if you have indeed been reading your Bibles, you will have noticed that most of these miracles that God performed always had a double purpose. It was to bless the person who needed the miracle, but it was also um, <clears throat> to reach people. And the other thing, of course, is that God um, would just perform those miracles through people like you and I. Very rarely did someone just wake up feeling healed about something or, or, or uh, wake up with a miracle. Um, some servant of God was always there to present the miracle. You know, I've had the privilege of seeing many healings and miracles over the years. Uh, some, of course, were performed by others, but some of them were performed um, through me, and it's always a great thrill whenever a miracle happens. But you know what? Seeing a person raised from the dead, that kind of tops them all. And I've not yet seen one of those miracles with my own eyes, um, but I was very close. Uh, in fact, uh, I was only three months away from seeing one. In a moment, I'm going to show you a video clip of a man who, like Tabitha, uh, also died, but through a miracle, 
came back to life. In fact, he died at the same table that Bernie and I uh, used to eat our meals uh, while we were visiting a church in Nigeria. We were there in January, and this happened in April the same year, just three months afterwards. But before we look at that, I want us to think about this knowledge that we all know. It came up last week in verse 35. Then the whole population of Lydda and Sharon saw Aeneas uh, walking around, and they turned to the Lord. One single miracle was able to impact this whole town. And today we have read about the same thing happening in the town of Joppa with Tabitha when she was raised back to life. So what is this knowledge that we actually all know? Well, if you have been listening to what is, God has been saying to us lately, the knowledge is that miracles are performed primarily for the sake of the unbelievers. The knowledge is that if we want to see more miracles happening in this church then we must do our part and go and bring unbelievers into our church. It's as simple as that. I mean, let's face it, if you've all been coming here for a number of years, you've all been saved, God's been working in your lives, if you had some sickness in the past, He's healed you, um, you know, if something has been going on in your life, God has done that for you, we're all mature Christians now, you know, we're all healed, we're all fixed, everything's good. You know, why would there be a need for miracles? Does that make sense? You know, and so uh, and, until, until new people start coming in who need the power of God to be working in their lives, like he did in your lives in the past, then of course that makes sense, that if we want to see miracles in this church or in any church, then we must either go out where the miracles are needed or bring in the need for the miracles. And I believe that with all of my heart. Now, what is... Now, that, of course, is knowledge that we already have. We know that. I've shared that with you many times. But when revelation comes, knowledge becomes motivation. It becomes motivated vision. And then when we have motivated vision, we might actually just start inviting people to church and let them experience the corporate presence of God. And if a miracle is needed to help them believe it will happen. You know, if I were to ask each one of you, how is it that you ended up in this journey of following the Lord? Most of you would probably say, well, someone invited me to church. In my case, Bernie invited me to church. She shared a little bit with me beforehand kind of sow the seeds, and the day that I went to church, I responded. It wasn't hard for you to invite me to church, was it? She just asked. I would have gone anywhere, she asked me, back in those days. But that's another story. Knowledge is passive information, but revelation produces active motivation. And that's why we need revelation from God. Having knowledge is not enough. And we need this active motivation because without it, we, we tend to stagnate. Without it, we tend to sit on the knowledge that we do have, knowledge that God actually wants us to share around. And so on all of our prayer lists should be the item of praying for the revelation of the Holy Spirit to show us God's will and purposes for our lives. Because the truth is, we need God's help to start walking and then keep walking in his purposes for us. It's easy to stray off. It's easy to just start doing life. It's easy to consume ourselves with working, with raising kids, with going to sleep, waking up, eating, and so on. And God just kind of like slips out of the picture. And if he slips out of the picture, the things that he wants us to accomplish in our lives also slips out of the picture. And one thing that we need to understand is that true satisfaction in life for the Christian only comes when we are, in fact, in the center of God's will, doing what he wants us to do. And that's not always turning the world upside down. That could be raising godly kids, 
I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. Been there, done that. But we, know, we need to know what He wants for us, and then we need to do our best to do it. And sometimes we need revelation of what that is to become motivated to do it. Knowing what we need to do or should be doing is just not enough. We need God's help to motivate us. And you know what? We should be humble enough to acknowledge that and then just ask God to help us, change us. Folks, we are surrounded by a multitude of people who are dying on the inside and in desperate need for a life that can only come from Jesus Christ. You see, when Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. He was not just talking about, uh, you know, uh, being the life in uh, eternity. He wasn't just talking about being life for us in the future. He is the life now. And without him, life is never life to the full. How many of you know that that's the truth? So what will we do with that knowledge? What will we do with this vital truth? Does anyone here happen to have a pet rat? No rat lovers in the house? Well, we used to have a pet rat called Rizzo. Big wide thing he was. And... Um, I think we bought him as a sweetener for my son Levi when we were called to go and pastor out in the country and we were taking them away from all of their friends and stuff and so I think uh, Rizzo was a sweetener for Levi. Now apparently um, rats, pet rats, are prone to getting cancer. Now if you had a rat sick with cancer and you know, he happened to just by chance have a drink of some brake fluid that you left lying around in your workshop, and then instead of dying, he actually got cured, what would you do? Let's say that you then wanted to prove a theory, and so you went around the neighborhood knocking on all the doors of your neighbors asking if they had any sick rats, and, and some of them said they did, and so you ended up with, you know, three or four rats with cancer. And so you took them home and you fed them brake fluid. And they also recovered. What would you do with that knowledge? If you were now sure the brake fluid would cure cancer, what, you, what would you do with that information? Some of you might try and you know, find a way to sell that cure and become rich. Some would just want to tell the world as soon as possible. But folks, regardless of whether you would want to cash in on the idea or not, none of you would just sit on it and not tell anyone. Is that right or not? Yes. Yes. You would want to tell people, I found the cure for cancer. Yes. It's brake fluid. <laughs> 9.99, it's super cheap. <laughs> and so if you, would, if you would all be willing to tell the world of a cure, for a sickness that kills the temporal body, how can we not have the same motivation to tell the world about a cure for eternal death? Are we cruel people who deliberately want to hog the good news to ourselves? Are we just selfish and, and we want to make sure that in heaven uh, that we're not going to get overcrowded <laughs> with all these people that get saved? Are we worried that we might have to share a room in heaven with someone that we don't know for the rest of eternity? And so better not let them all go up there so that we can have a room to ourselves? Is that how we think? Of course not. And in our heart of hearts, we would all like to have the freedom to be able to share our faith with others all the time. I know that that's in the heart of every Christian. But sometimes what's in our heart is not enough. You see, we don't do it. We often don't do the very thing that we'd like to do. And we don't do it most often because we're under the influence of spiritual forces that want to keep us from preaching the gospel and saving humanity. 
It's a spiritual war that's going on. Give me one other good reason why, as a people, most Christians would be shy about telling people about the way, the truth, and the life, but would have absolutely no hesitation going on national TV and telling everyone about how they discovered that brake fluid cured cancer. By the way, if you do have a sick rat or pit at home, please don't go giving them brake fluid because I was only using that as an illustration. Trust me, the only thing brake fluid will do to your rat is send it to a cheesy happy, grunt, happy hunting ground real fast, okay? You know, I've heard ministers of the gospel have video edited so that it sounds like they're telling people things like that. So someone might want to edit this video and say, Pastor George is saying the brake fluid kills cancer. What a weirdo. Anyway, reluctance, you know, to proclaim the way, the truth, and the life is not a new problem. The church has always been opposed spiritually to prevent us from proclaiming the good news. This is an old problem. Standing up for Jesus and preaching his gospel has never been a walk in the park, and it never will be. Some people have been killed for doing that. Some people are still being killed for doing that in certain countries. We have people in this church who came from countries where their family would be at risk if they knew that they had become Christians. This is real people. This is happening. The writer of the book of Hebrews had to battle the same forces that try and discourage us from preaching the gospel today. Why else would he ask the church to pray for him to continue preaching the gospel fearlessly? He says in Ephesians 6 verse 19 and 20, Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Likewise, we should pray that we too may be able to declare the good news fearlessly. You see, we need to pray because we are in a battle. And it's not a battle that we can fight with our fists or that we can fight with guns. It's a battle that is spiritual. But it's as real a battle as any physical war is real. And we are crazy if we try to fight this battle without taking proper precautions. The Apostle Paul tells us what kind of precautions we need to take daily. He says in Ephesians 6, 11 to 18, put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of, unseen, of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. You know what? Many Christians forget or they just simply don't even believe that these evil powers actually still exist. And that they are committed to harass us and to interfere with God's will for our lives. I mean, this is real. Paul is not making this stuff up. You know, Pastor Bernie reminded us this morning of, you know, when, when Daniel was praying um, about something, that God answered him. But guess what? The answer took three weeks to get to him. And why did it take three weeks? Because the prince, the power, the principality of that area had interfered with the angel and tried to prevent him from delivering the answer. So this is real stuff. These beings actually do exist. Some of them might be eavesdropping in on us right now. Let's read on, verse 13. Therefore, therefore why? Therefore, because of all of this, therefore put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then, after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Guess what? There will be battles. Guess what? You're not always going to be able to avoid them. 
You know, when, uh, you know, when you're minding your own business, everything's going good, and then suddenly everything starts going wrong. You know, your car packs up, your, your neighbors start playing up, your kids start going unruly, everything just seems to be going wrong, things at work are going wrong or whatever. Do you know what that is? You just entered into a battle. And you don't even know that you're in a battle. But guess what? These things happen. And so when they happen, verse 14 tells us to stand your ground. Putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. Now there is, of course, a sermon on its own in these words. But did you notice that these words are not passive words? I mean, they are words of war. They are fighting words. Because we are in a fight. Right now, we are in one of the biggest spiritual battles that the church has had to fight for many, many years. The whole world is under attack, but they don't know it's a spiritual attack. They think it's a pandemic. Their minds have been filled with fear and doubt. And with those two things, the enemy can control people. And he is all over the world. Now, I am not at all against wearing masks. The truth is that I've had less colds in the last couple of years than I've ever had, and maybe that's because people have been wearing masks or I've been more careful about getting close to people who have colds or whatever. So I've got nothing against masks. But you know what? I was driving around, uh, and I have seen people absolutely on their own walking in the middle of nowhere with masks. And I've seen others driving their cars on their own with nobody in there wearing masks. Now, I don't know about you, but I find those things a bit oppressive. I don't like breathing my own carbon monoxide all the time, you know? So why would you do that when you don't have to? Because of fear. Fear in their minds. You see, where do you think the devil instigates his schemes or strategies. How and where do the spiritual for forces confront us? They do it in our minds. They do it in the minds of people, that's where. The battleground is always in the mind. You know, when Jesus was in the desert for those 40 days being tempted by the devil, <coughs> excuse me, where do you think it was all happening? Do you think the devil was there in person with his pitchfork? No, it was in the mind. Jesus was battling in the mind, those temptations. Paul again reminds us that our battles are spiritual in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3 and 4. We are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. What a challenge that is these days, to destroy false arguments. We're surrounded by them. Everyone is telling untruths. Everyone is telling truth, uh, untruths as if they are truth and criticizing you if you don't believe that. A lot more prayer is needed for those in deception to wake up and see that they are indeed in a spiritual battle. If the church of Jesus Christ doesn't realize that there is no one else on earth capable of fighting this battle, then the world truly is lost before its time. Meaning, lost before Jesus even comes back. But putting this pandemic <clears throat> battle aside, we do need to remember that every spiritual battle is fought in the mind. That's where the battle takes place. And it's in the mind that the, the ever-present reluctance 
arises to rob us of the freedom to share the good news with people that we know need to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And you know, it's not just strangers we're talking about, it's people that in our lives, people that we care about, people that we work with, extended family members, friends, neighbors up and down the street, people that we actually care about, and yet we seem reluctant to share what we know they desperately need. It's not because you're mean. It's not because you're lazy. It's not because you just don't want to obey God. It's because you are in a spiritual battle and you haven't realized it. <clears throat> and when you realize that you're in a spiritual battle, then we got to follow the advice and not try to use worldly weapons because <clears throat> they don't work. So let's not get caught wondering why we would be willing to tell the world about a cancer cure but not so willing to tell them about an eternal cure. The devil doesn't want you to tell anyone that. And so he will try to intimidate you if you let him. So don't let him rule your mind. As Paul would say, be alert to his schemes and don't let him control you. In the meantime, if you don't feel comfortable telling people the good news, at least invite them to come to church like Bernie did with me. And let the Holy Spirit work on their hearts. You know, when Brittany invited me to her church, you know, it was the presence of God that got me over the line. Yes, she had sown seeds. She had shared a testimony. She had got me interested enough to want to go to church. But it was in that church service where I felt the presence of God. Um, and, and, and as I looked around at the other worshipers, I said to myself, this is what I want. This is what I need. And so the presence of God in that room that, uh, that morning just um, made me want God. And you see, we take this for granted. You know, we come in here and, and you know, we sing, um, you know, half-heartedly sometimes, you know, and, and you know, we're half-worshipping and, and, and sometimes we're singing and, and we got our minds on other things or whatever. And, and, and we take for granted the presence of God. But you know what? If an unbeliever walks in, they're going to feel it. You know, we kind of, you know, got used to it a bit, but they haven't. And so when they come in, they feel, they feel the presence of God. They look around you and they see God all over you. We don't. It's old hat to us. So never, never take um, for granted the impact that, that just a corporate presence of God. You see, Jesus in you, Jesus in you, Jesus in you plus Jesus in you, plus Jesus in me, makes a big Jesus. You know? And so when people come in, they feel Jesus. They don't know that that's what they feel, but they do. You may have heard that T.B. Joshua died a few months ago. T.B. Joshua was the pastor of that church in Nigeria that Bernie and I went, spent nine days at. He finished preaching one Sunday in June, and he went to his room where he then died in his chair. Peacefully, it appears. So I don't know how things are going in this church at the moment, but I do know that when Bernie and I went there, the reason that so many healings and miracles were happening every day was because that church had so many unbelievers just flocking to it. They had heard the stories of the miracles, and so they would go there seeking miracles for themselves. And after they saw the miracles, they became believers. If we go out and invite the unbelievers to come, we too will see more and more miracles in this place. And the unbelievers in our community will become believers. Amen? Amen. When Tabitha was raised back to life, the whole town heard about it, and many became believers because of it. How could you not believe when you see a miracle like that? I mean, she was dead, dead. They had already washed her. They had already prepared her for burial. She didn't just pass out. She was a goner. Can you imagine how those people would have felt when they would seen her just come back to life? Well, the video that I'm about to show you puts in visual form for us today what happened to Tabitha when she lay dead on her bed before Peter went in and prayed for her. And this is a recording of what happened to a South African businessman called Moses Maroli, 
who went to visit T.B. Joshua's church in the hope of getting healed of his diabetes and high blood pressure. He was 76 years old at the time, and he was in the lunchroom where Bernie and I um, used to go in between uh, events to have our meals and also to escape the heat and humidity um, in the air conditioning. It was the coldest room in the whole complex. Suddenly the man dropped dead to the floor, and at first the other guests kind of thought that maybe he'd just come under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, as sometimes that happens. You end up on the floor. But soon they realized there was something wrong. And, and after, um, after them, a few of them started working on him for nearly 30 minutes, a visiting doctor who had tried very hard to resuscitate him pronounced him dead. Most of the visitors uh, carried their cameras with them all the time, as I did, because you never knew when something you know, was going to happen that was worth recording. And so, in this case, some visitors started recording once people realized that something indeed was wrong with Brother Moses. Now, I've edited the video to shorten it because the original is quite long, and unfortunately, the audio and video quality is quite poor in places. But it's good enough to give us an idea of what happened to Tabitha and, of course, what happened to Moses. Uh, the video clip starts with Moses just speaking um, for a little bit after uh, the event of his death, and then it moves to the neurosurgeon who had tried so hard to revive him. I have two that are ready, and I'm going to hide my two that are ready to be the front door. I have to admit it was a shock to me because I couldn't uh, believe what I saw. His, his eyes were open, scary. I not responding. I couldn't see any bleeding or spontaneous fall. Did that happen in my head? Uh, uh, yes, I did, but that was not an eye. That happened last time. Oh, how? No, no. Are you sure you were saying he did? The judge revealed his testimony in the events of that day. He showed his mother's son away at night in the dark room.
Awesome, eh? You know, from the time that Moses died in the dining room to the time that Joshua prayed for him, uh, he had been dead for 90 minutes. A few words of faith is all it took to raise a man back to life. A man that had been pronounced clinically dead for 90 minutes. For one and a half hours, Moses had been dead. Eight words repeated three times. We didn't quite see it on the video, but that's what he said. Eight words repeated three times is all it took to bring back a dead man that a neurosurgeon had said could not have been brought back to life even with the very best of medical facilities. Only our living God can bring the dead back to life like that. Amen? And yet this awesome and living God choose us to let us have a part in his miracles. He lets us participate in his miraculous power. In this case, we just saw he lets a man participate by just saying eight simple words three times. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise again. Rise again. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise again. Rise again, once more, and then, ah! <laughs> oh, praise God for His goodness. Amen? You know, I've got a, another incredible video um, that I you know, couldn't show you for reasons, and I don't know if I wanted to because it's pretty gruesome, but um, it was about a woman that um, was on the way to hospital, and she, had, uh, she delivered a baby in the car, on the way to hospital, but when the baby was born, it was stillborn. And she was then rushed to uh, the church in the middle of the night with her green baby. And you could see on video, the baby was green. You could see the baby was dead. And in the video, you saw a nurse who happened to be at the church at the time, and she tried to revive the baby for about 20 minutes, and she squeezed that baby's chest so hard that it looked like a rag doll. I mean, if that baby had been living, she would have killed it. You know, that's how harsh she was with it, but she was trying to bring the baby back, and it didn't. T.B. Joshua was in bed, and one of the deacons went to wake him up to come and pray for the baby, but he didn't want to get out of bed. And so he told the deacon, hey, just go and put my sermon notes on the baby. And so in the video, you see this. Suddenly, you know, this person shows up and they're putting like paper on the baby. You think like, what's he doing? Because we didn't know that that's what it was at the time. And, uh, and as soon as the, the, the sermon notes went on the baby, the baby turned pink and started to cry. Absolutely incredible. Um, and, um, you know, it was, yeah, I, you know, the, the, the recording's st still on, on VHS video, and it's like a bit tricky to convert it, but if I get to do that, I, and if the Lord leads me, I might show it to you sometime. You know, some people have tried to discredit uh, what happened to Moses Moroli as, uh, as fake, and, and, you know, I would have been skeptical myself if I had not spent nine days in that church and seen countless other miracles with my own eyes. People getting up off wheelchairs and, and all kinds of terrible things being healed right before our eyes. So I tell you what, yes, I absolutely believe that this was a real resurrection from the dead, just like Tabitha's. You know, folks, life is fragile. We, we just never know when it will be snuffed out from us. And so it pays to live right before God. It pays to live in His will so that we are always ready to meet the Lord anytime. Amen? Amen? Brother Moses had no idea that he was going to face death while waiting for a healing in Nigeria. He didn't go there to die. He went there to be healed. However, death came when he least expected it, but God had mercy on his family and brought him back from the dead. <coughs> You know, we <clears throat> serve a God who is all-powerful. A God with whom 
all things are possible because he is the master of all things. Time is in his hands. Life is in his breath and the future will be whatever he plans it to be. So make sure that you make the right choice to be a part of his future. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> we serve a God who is the way, the truth, and the life. Can I have the worship team up, please? And, um, you know, if you have never accepted him as your Lord, then invite him to be your Lord and Savior today. Give him your life and he'll give you his. And with his life in you, <laughs> you will be changed. Church, which one of you is not grateful to the one or ones who introduce you to Jesus? You know, we all are. We're all very grateful. And you know what? So will those whom you introduce to Jesus. You know, I have forgotten a lot of people over the years. You know, people that I've met, sometimes, you know, people I've had a lot of relationship with, and now I can't even remember their names, but you know who I cannot forget? The three people who were instrumental in my journey of finding Jesus. I will never forget them. I will never forget their faces. I'll never forget their names. Don't let the devil intimidate you from proclaiming who the way, the truth, and the life is. If you have been living under intimidation that has stopped you from talking about the truth and the life, then why don't you just come forward and surrender that intimidation to the Lord Jesus and let him give you the boldness to speak about the way, the truth, and the life. If you're in pain in any way, then hey, come and let that go today. You know, let Jesus take your pain away. And if you just need a touch from God and a dose of his love, then you come too and <clears throat> we'll <clears throat> gladly pray for that to happen for you this morning. And all the people, all of God's people said, amen. Indeed, amen. God bless you.